Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this virtual professional development opportunity. My name is Joe Schmidt, and I am the Social Studies Specialist for the Maine Department of Education. Today, I am excited to be joining a duo teammates from New Gloucester High School, Gray New Gloucester High School, uh, Bobby Thibodeau and Amy Stanley. They will be here today to talk about teaching global competencies in Maine public school classrooms and they're here to share about how they've implemented it and the great important work that can be done with uh, these ideas. So without any further ado, I will turn it over to Bobby and Amy. Thanks, Joe. Um, I'm really glad to be here today. Uh, mostly I'm excited about the opportunity to talk to my fellow Maine public school educators about this topic. It's something that's very close to my heart. Um, teaching global competencies, especially in rural to semi-rural public schools in Maine. Um, it's a very challenging endeavor, but worthwhile. It's something I am passionate about and something I spend a lot of time thinking about and working on. Um, so I'm grateful today to have this opportunity to share resources and discuss the topic with other teachers and schools in Maine striving toward this common goal. Having opportunities like this to connect and collaborate as teachers and as schools can increase our success, which means better outcomes. I'm very goal oriented. <laughs> So thank you, Joe, for all of your work coordinating this at the state level and making it happen. And thank you to all the teachers um, out there attending. I'm glad to have this opportunity to meet you and hope you're able to take something useful away from this talk. I hope you do ask questions um, and participate throughout the, this discussion, but encourage you also to reach out afterwards if you want, um, as we're moving towards um, continuing to teach global competencies in main schools. So a little bit about me. I'm the IB coordinator and a social studies teacher at Grand New Gloucester High School. Grand New Gloucester is a public semi-rural school. It's also an IB school, which means that we offer um, one of the four IB programs. At G&G, we offer the IB diploma program. We're one of four schools in Maine that offer the IB diploma program. The IB diploma, if you're not familiar with it, is one of the most prestigious qualifications available to high school students anywhere in the world. Um, and it's internationally standardized. So I have to say, like, personally, there is something immensely satisfying um, for me as a public school teacher to be able to offer an open IB program for students in this community and see them um, grow and benefit from it, regardless of their family income or their family's educational background and have that all be part of their free public school education. So love it. If you ever wanted to know more about the IB program, please don't hesitate to reach out. I've been teaching social studies for over 10 years. Now before G&G, I taught at Bonnie Eagle High School, which has a similar demographic, but it's a larger school, I, which I really enjoyed. Great staff there. And we're able to do a lot of really good work toward teaching global competencies. Um, I was fortunate enough to be selected as a teacher for Global Classrooms Fellow. This is something that I would recommend you look into if you're if you're looking for opportunities for professional development that are quality and um, meaningful. They do it every year. As as part of the fellowship, I completed a year long course on uh, how to teach global competencies, and I did that alongside all the other fellows, which are from across the country, and also included in that that year was a two week field study um, and this. This is all federally funded. They decide where you're going to go. And I was sent to Morocco for mine, which was a great opportunity. And I had the opportunity to network with teachers in other countries, which is very helpful if you're trying to make these connections um, for our students. I also was able to get uh, was selected for a Fund for Teachers Fellowship. If you're not familiar with this, um, in this program, teachers can submit a self-designed professional development proposal. So I designed a um, three-week study tour of Cambodia and Vietnam, and I applied a couple couple of years in a row, and eventually I did did win it and was able to to do that. So another great way to try to get some um, more like experience and more global awareness and materials and connections into your your classrooms if you're you're interested in it. As an undergraduate, I was fortunate enough to be able to study uh, for a whole year abroad as well through the World College um, in at Long Island University. They have different campuses around the world. And I said comparative religion and culture in Japan, India, and Israel, like one after the other. 
I ended up getting my bachelor's in psychology and I have a master's in teaching methodology, uh, specifically in social studies. And then I'm currently working on my education specialist degree in technology, um, education technology with a specialty in games and simulations. So uh, it's something like, it's something that I have like been working on, I guess a lot in, from a lot of different angles. Um, so even though like, obviously I've been very fortunate and I've been able to travel quite a bit in study religion and culture, both formally and informally. I am a Mainer. I was, I was born in a small town in Maine and I grew up in a small rural community in Maine, like a really small town. Um, in my town, there were like eight churches but only one traffic light and it wasn't even a full traffic light. It was just one that flashed. So if you're from up north and you know what I'm talking about, um, you can probably tell from the picture though, that unlike most Mainers, I'm not 100% white. My father came to the US as a very young man alone, um, as a refugee from South Vietnam. He had served as a teenager alongside American soldiers in the war. And he was, he was really lucky to escape Saigon at the end of the war. My mother is white. She also was very young, um, had a completely different, but equally desperate and traumatic backstory. Her family was financially and structurally devastated by the loss of her father. From, from the same war. So these two storylines cross paths in Maine of all places. And then you get me, you know, their first born child. So my first name is Bobby. I was named after my mom's father. And my middle name is Ian, which is Vietnamese and means peace. So there's a lot of information, but I'm sharing it with you because it does, I think, um, help explain my somewhat unique perspective when it comes to teaching global competencies in Maine public schools. I can't remember a time when I personally have not been fascinated with identity formation and um, the nature of human perspective. It's um, a lifelong quest, you know, for me, and it really has been a central focus you know, of my life. It's it's motivated by my need to understand what is going on, and also my my desire to make things better. So at the risk of having Joe make fun of me for being overly idealistic, uh, I, from all of my studies and all of my years and all of my work thinking about this, I, um, I do think social studies education is one of the answers. Um, I am confident that if we are able to effectively teach global competencies to all students, the world would be a better place. So what I've done here for you today is I've have three simple things I want to go through. What are global competencies? Why teach global competencies? And how to teach global competencies? Now, I think it's important that you have all this information because it might be useful to you in some way, but I'm also hoping and assuming that most of you are here because you, you already know what they are to a certain degree. Even if it's not the same definition that I had, you, you kind of know what we're talking about and you are already doing it, I'm guessing. And maybe you've been doing it for a long time. And in that, if that's the case, then you know how hard it is to do that. You know what the problem is. Um, and that's you know, maybe why you would choose to you know, sign up for a webinar about like, how to teach it in Maine public schools uh, specifically, because it is challenging. So I want to present that those first three things, and I will have a lot of resources for you that will be available um, in a shared folder. But I'm hoping to be able to get to the fourth thing, which is what I really want to spend more time on is teaching global companies specifically in main public school classrooms. I want to focus on the challenges themselves. So I want you to think about what the challenges are to effectively teaching global companies using your classroom. What is it that made you, you know, come here? What's the question that you can't answer? What's the, the important question, the, the really big one? And maybe it's something that you can't say because it's hard to put into words or it's it would be seen as like um like controversial or like it's it's a problem that maybe people would say we can't fix so you know why bring it up if it's one of those things it's okay too um i think if that's where the answer is if that's the real problem that's what we should be focusing on so much of our pd it seems like is about trying to teach us um what you know, what global, global companies are and um, kind of trick, like try to like it, tell us what to do as if like we just need to know what it is or 
be convinced that it's important. Like, I think most people in this field get that. And there are real problems and real challenges. And I'm, I'm hoping that we can use this opportunity to discuss some of those. So one of the things that, that I do in my classroom is I teach students to ask complete questions. And this is a strategy that I was hoping we could practice today. So this helps them to ask questions that they, for important things like that, things that they want the answer to, that they need the answer to, but they can't ask because it's offensive or they don't know how to say it in a way that will actually get the answers that they want. So I teach them to um, give the question some context. So think about what type of answer they might be looking for, what the answer might be. It's one way to do it. Um, and kind of put that in the beginning and, uh, frame, and frame it in such a way that they're able to make it a complete question so it's not controversial. So we do examples of this and then I have them practice um, doing questions like this before we have guest speakers. And I think it's something that is helpful and it's something you can use in any, any situation to try to like help them know how to have these types of conversations. So if, if you um, want to, you can try to use this strategy yourself when you're creating your question. So giving, give some kind of context at the beginning um, and then ask the question. So it's not just um, thrown out there. Uh, this, this strategy I, I got from the Global Nomads Group which is a, a great organization that I highly recommend if you haven't heard of it. I put a little like, screenshot of one of, their, one of their many programs on there. The other thing when it comes to the questions, still on like what types of questions to ask. Um, I like to try to help students think about different perspectives. And that can be hard, especially in, in Maine, where we have a relatively um, culturally homogeneous population. A lot of times the answers are all the same and everyone's very convinced that there's only you know, one right answer. Um, so in those conversations, I always ask, like, does anyone have a perspective we haven't heard? Or I try to ask the second part, like the one with the example there, like what other perspectives are, are are not being represented? What's the thing that's unsaid? Um, and I'll, I'll say like, even if you don't believe it, you know, even if it's not something that you believe, what is another way you could look at the situation? Um, what information is not there? So when you're coming up with your questions, don't feel like you have to stick with just um, your own personal experience. You can think about what other, other people might, you know, have questions about. Uh, and we can try to broaden the, the discussion in that way to make it more inclusive. So this chart, again, is something I took from the Global Nomads Group. Uh, a few years ago, I did this program with them called the Youth Talk Program, where they train, they match your classroom up with a classroom in the Middle East. And the students have the opportunity to learn together about how to um, communicate interculturally using video conferencing. And it's a very explicit, like high quality training for the students. Then they go through this whole process of practicing it while they work on you know, some, some issues. So um, the, it's a very effective program, well-designed and effective, and there is a cost associated with it. But things like that can, can really make a huge difference in, in an entire like, school and community because the things that they learn from that experience will spread and will go, go out further. So try to write a complete question and think about what other questions you know, or perspectives could you share that might be out there that would be interesting to discuss. So what are global competencies? There are lots of ways you could define it. I use the one put out by the Asia Society. It's, I think, the um, most common one. Here's our can you guys still see my screen? Right now it's white, Bobby. Okay, one second. All right.
are four key elements of global competence. Global competence starts by being aware, curious, and interested in learning about the world and how it works. Students are able to ask globally significant questions, analyze evidence from multiple sources, and develop an argument that draws defensible conclusions. Students recognize that they have a perspective and someone else may or may not share it. They weigh all sides and from that incorporate different perspectives into their point of view. Globally competent students effectively communicate their ideas with diverse audiences, including through the use of appropriate technology. While English is the primary language of business, speaking another language is important for collaborating across borders. By applying what they have learned, students can translate their ideas into appropriate actions to discover solutions for both local and global challenges. We now face a critical imperative to prepare all students for work and civic roles in an environment where success increasingly requires the ability to compete, connect, and cooperate on an international scale. One second. All right, so a brief, a brief uh, overview of what the what global competence is, um, and there are more resources that can go in, that will go into more detail for for you that you can use. But that I think from what I've seen, um, that that circle is the the most um, commonly used one at this point, and it's it's effective. So why teach global competencies? We live in a rapidly changing, increasingly connected global society. And all of the whys kind of build off of this truth. So it, it really comes down to, um, if you accept this as true, then it makes sense. Uh, the US Department of Education and National Affairs, their objective number one is to increase global and cultural competencies of all US citizens. And they say that the global and cultural competencies comprise the knowledge and skills necessary to, um, to be successful in today's interconnected world and to fully engage in and act on issues of global significance. Our students need to be equipped with critical thinking, communications and social emotional and language skills in order to work effectively with their counterparts in the United States and around the world. Understanding and appreciating our diverse country other parts of the world, including different religions, cultures, and points of view are essential elements of global and cultural competence. So this is from the United States of America, International Affairs, and it's objective number one. I'm not trying to convince you all of like why we should teach it. I'm assuming if you're here, you agree that it should be taught and this isn't a new idea. It's something that we in the, in the field of education have been working on for, for quite a, a while but it is useful when you are trying to do this work in your own communities to um, make sure that you have everyone on board so when you're communicating with stakeholders in in throughout the entire community so parents administration when you're talking about why you're doing this it's not just about you know you personally or anything that you you personally believe it this is something that is coming from um, the the country. This is the chart that uh, they use that or they created, and this is all available on the the United States website um, for for global and cultural competencies. So if you're looking for something that is grounded that can create like a framework um, or give uh, help explain to people why we're teaching global competencies, this is something that might be helpful. You also could look to the National Council of Social Studies, um, which calls out this again, specifically as essential for, for students in the 21st century. Um, the United Nations Global Education First Initiative also discusses it, talking about how it's not enough for education to produce individuals who can read, write, and count. Education must be transformative and bring shared values to life. It must cultivate an active care for the world and for those with whom we share it. So this is something 
again, that you could pull pull from for as a why to, to explain why we're, we're doing this. This isn't um, an opinion. This is something that is from the United Nations Global Education First Mission. At our school, we, we um, are an IB school, so IB learner profile or IB mission statements are something that we can, we can lean upon. And I'm sure that you all in your own schools have your own mission statements that, or goals for students that are similar to this. And if you look in those, I'm sure you, you can find um, the case for global competencies. So when you're, when you're talking about why we're doing this, it has to start with one of these things. And then how, as an overview. So this work has been done already. There have been people working on this all over the world um, for a while now. So if you're um, getting started, there's a lot of stuff that's out there for you. I have pulled together these frameworks and this information for you and put it in a shared folder so that you can access it. And um, I'll tell you a little bit about each one of them. These are probably, there's a lot of information out there. So these are you know, what I think would be like the most useful for for anyone like within this you should be able to find what what you need if you're looking at um, creating something that will work in your classroom or at the school or even you know at the district level um, you should be able to find what different things that will help you in, in these these uh, pdfs so the you can see that they span in date, so 2008 to 2020. And you might think, well, just look at the first one, the last one, because it's the most current. And there is like some, some merit to that decision. But I did include the, these earlier ones um, on purpose because like this one right here, the 2011 one uh, is 120 pages. So it includes a lot more specific information that, will, that might be useful to you. This is the one that I studied when I did the fellowship for Teachers for Global Classrooms. And um, within this one, you'll find everything. It has like all the definitions, um, detailed examples of each of the four categories that are there, uh, rationales, um, materials for each different discipline and even grade levels, um, rubrics, uh, like all the different things that could possibly you know, be useful for, you know, to you when you're doing this work. You don't have to try to create it all on your own. You can go to one of these things. So these two, um, both in 2018, there's a lot of overlap from the 2011 uh, document, but they also have, it's become a little bit more concise and it's, uh, they're addressing each other, you know, as well. So they're working more collaboratively and you can see kind of this framework kind of taking, you know, shape, something a little bit firmer. Um, the 2020 California Global Education Project is the global competence framework that they that they use. And this one's short, it's a PDF, and I thought it might be helpful to schools that are trying to create their own type of framework that will that will work at the school or district level to have as an exemplar. And they built their, their framework using the same resources. Like you can still see like the, the uh, Asia Society um, charts and it's all built off of that. You can kind of see how they did that. And I also put a PDF of the IB programs because uh, international mindedness and global competencies are like an integral part of the program. So it makes it really easy to, to facilitate. Oh, that's not what I meant to do, sorry. All right, so these are the, the links for the resources. Um, I don't, I can't see the chat box. I was gonna like put that these links in there um, for you, but I can share them afterwards too. So there's a Google folder that has all of the PDFs in there. And then in that folder, there's also a document um, where I started listing some URLs. And you're free, please feel free to add resources to this as well. I know that you probably have some great resources that would be useful to other main teachers. So feel free to add things and take anything that you um, want to use from it. There's also a Padlet in here from um, a few years ago when my colleague and I, and, and I Michelle Scattered, did a similar presentation at uh, the Social Studies Conference. So that is in there too, and that's still a, a developing um, resource for people to collaborate on. So you, you can find a lot of specific things there and, and contribute things as well. 
So that was the, in a nutshell, right? I did the things I said I would do. I explained what they were, um, why we should teach them, and then gave you everything you needed to, to, for how to teach them, like all the frameworks for every discipline and grade level. So those are all yeah, there for you. So now we can say, uh, get to the more interesting part of the discussion um, and discuss like what the, the real challenges are for us in your work, if there are any questions in the chat or in the Q&A part, I can't see them. Nothing so far, Bobby, but people can feel this is this is Amy Stanley. People can free to put any questions or comments in the Q&A box and I will make sure that Bobby gets them. Okay. I did include some questions just in case like there weren't any um, that came up that have come up before. Again, other other times I've talked about this. Um, so we can talk about some of those too. And I want to share this um, information. Uh, so this is from the director of the Global Classroom Project in Seattle for their World Affairs Council. We have a main World Affairs Council too that does some great um, programs that might be interesting to you. But for this, this project, they were trying to um, bring, like help uh, schools teach global competencies in lots of different rural communities. And they identified some specific challenges for rural communities that I think are gonna really be similar to the, the things that we're facing here. So the first being limited access to resources and then fewer opportunities for professional development being two main, main themes that arose. And I think that if you're thinking about the challenges that your school is facing, when, when you're trying to teach global consciousness, they probably fall in those, into the same categories. Um, these are the lessons that they learned from their their year-long project where they tried to teach global competencies in, in a lot of rural public schools. Um, the first is develop trust and collaborative relationships with key educational stakeholders in each school. And this is something that I think definitely is, is perhaps the most important um, step when it comes to being effective. Like people need to understand what you're doing and why you're doing it. And the more proactive you can be about it, the, the better. Um, and that's why, you know, if you, if you think about it and you have some of those um, like mission statements and goals that were identified at the, in um, this presentation, if you have those up front and you start with that, it can be, it can be really helpful. I think a lot of these other um, things on here, they might look familiar to you as, as challenges, but I think a lot of them definitely can be, um, could, could fall under the category of resources too. And when I say resources, I also am including time. So it's not just money, but also time to connect with other teachers or develop high quality materials um, or customize effective lesson plans for, for a specific area or community. All of that takes time, which isn't something that a lot of public schools um, have a lot of, teachers have a lot of. Any questions yet, Amy? None so far. All right. All right, well, I'll go through the first couple of things that I was thinking of that were that have, have been questions that have come up before and things that I've, um, I see as, as a challenge working in rural public schools when I'm trying to do this type of work. And that being like trust. And that goes to that first statement that you said, having those trusting relationships with the key stakeholders. So definitely having, um, having those mission statements up front is good. One question that, was, that arose before is that parents would say things like, this isn't the social studies or the history that I was taught. And like, how, to, how do you approach that or, or what do you do? And when, when I get this question, or if it arises for me, I talk about what social studies is really about. If social studies is really skill-based, first of all, and, and the whole goal of education is, for, is to prepare students for success in the world. And that is the same. Um, what, because the world is changing, and you can go back to that, that need to um, prepare students for success in this rapidly changing world with increasingly connected through technology, social studies, the, the classes have to change as well. 
And if they didn't change, then we would be um, not fulfilling that goal, which is the thing that's saying the thing. That's, that's what's consistent. Um, you can, when, you're, when we're thinking about trust, having clear definitions for the things that you're talking about, I think it's also important. I put a link in here for some of the terms that Kendi was using in his um, anti-racism book, which are really useful. A question that's come up before is like, how do I teach something that I don't know if you're a teacher and um, you, you haven't traveled or you don't know about these different cultures, how can you possibly like teach that? And you know, the answer is like that you can't teach it and that's, I think, what you teach. You teach that you don't know. Um, obviously, like that TED talk about the, the danger of a single story would be helpful in this situation. Um, and then I think having, being able to like model that thought process out loud for students, the idea that you don't know is important because that can help um, not only build trust so they, they believe you when you are teaching them things, but also help them start to think in that way too. And that's a big part of um, understanding uh, different perspectives. And that's, I think, the most, Im most important, most challenging thing about uh, teaching global competencies in rural public schools that are culturally homogeneous is that it's really about perspective. And there are not many opportunities for students to to learn about other perspectives naturally in this in communities like this. Um, and so it's, it's really challenging. Yeah, I think it's one of the biggest challenges. A question that's come up before is, do our kids really need to know this? When will they use this? Uh, this you could answer like in the same way that you would for a math question. Like if they don't know it, they definitely won't ever use it. And then again, going back to those those initial like why we're teaching it and um, accepting that fact that we do live in a rapidly changing world that's increasingly connected through technology. Um, I try to reframe this if possible. So instead of instead of having them look at it as, as you're trying to teach them to be something that they're not, instead like I try to like help them see that their kids are deserving of having these same skills. Like these are the skills that are going to help people be successful in the future. They are the skills that our leaders are going to have. And don't these kids deserve to have access to these same skills? Um, and then this is the last thing I'll, I'll say, I'll close here. Uh, and this is kind of like sums up my thoughts on teaching uh, perspectives. Um, global perspectives are an attitude. And when I say attitude, I mean like in the um, categories of things that can be taught in Gagne's like uh, conditions for learning. I don't know how long it's been since you've been in teacher school, but to refresh your memory, there are different categories you know, of things that can be learned and um, attitude is its own category. And the way that you teach attitude is through experience or through modeling. It has to be like modeled by someone that they, they respect. It's not something you can tell someone to do. You can tell someone, you can tell people that they should be um, global citizens or care about other perspectives like over and over again, but it doesn't really create that, that learning of attitude. They have to have some kind of experience where they, they see it or they have to see it modeled. And because there aren't many opportunities in this community for that to happen for our students, but then also for the larger you know, community too, that's part of what makes this so challenging. Um, so what I try to focus on in, in my work is to create lessons and activities like that are you know, for appropriate for whatever situation I'm in that are experiential. So using Piaget, you know, those, the constructivist techniques to create an experiential learning ex activity um, for global, for a global perspective. Um, and there are lots of different ways you can do that. And I think if you, you, you keep this in mind, I guess, when you look at the different examples and the matrices and stuff like that that are in those PDFs, then I think it'll help you kind of um, see it. And if, you're, if you have this in mind, then when you're coming up with things that are appropriate for your classroom, it will make it more effective.
All right, so this is this is the last thing that I'll, that I'll talk about with you who are opposed. So sometimes I get the sense that some people don't want to learn about other perspectives because they feel like they're betraying their own people. <laughs> Or like they feel like in a way it would be it's like the other like why understand the other um, when they they are themselves and um, they can't sometimes understand understand like empathize or understand other perspectives because they've already got like their feelings about what is true. Um, so I tell this story, the cup of tea story. Um, is Nanin, who's a Japanese master. Um, he uh, has this university professor who comes in to inquire about Zen and sometimes the story is about Taoism, but this one is Zen. And um, he serves him some tea and he, pour, he pours the, the professor's cup and keeps on pouring and pouring and pouring until the tea is overflowing and the professor is, is livid and he's like, you're spilling everything everywhere. Um, and that's when um, the master says, like, like this cup, you're, you're full of your own opinions and speculation. So you can't learn um, something else unless you empty the cup. So if you already have all of your answers, then you can't, um, how can you understand a different perspective? And that's really part of what's tricky about teaching different perspectives is uh, you have your own perspective. And so it's hard to, to comprehend that. So I, I encourage students to think of that, like their beliefs as like that cup of tea. And I say, you don't have to dump it out. You can just put it down, you know, for a while and try to hear this and listen to this and in an empathetic way, um, as if it were true. Just, just understand it. And then at the end, when you're done, after you've learned it, you get to pick up your cup again, you know, and it's still there and it's yours. But it's impossible really to learn about another perspective if, um, if you're looking at it in a non-empathetic way. And that goes back to what we were just saying about attitudes. Right, and learning how you learn from this attitude, it has to be experience. It's not something you can just tell somebody. So hopefully, hopefully that is helpful. Sorry, I'm gonna stop sharing. So are there any other questions at this time? Oh, I see some. We'd love to have some questions. Uh, if, if you have them, if you wouldn't mind putting them in the Q&A box and I can make sure that Bobby gets them. We will also take some time. I forgot to say this before we hit, got started. Um, after we stop the recording, we can also have um, some conversation as well. If you have questions, or potentially want to talk with Bobby and Amy, we can bring you right in to have a discussion with that. Um, but I try to give that level of privacy because not everybody wants to be recorded on the screen. So you do have that option as well. So we will kind of do a little bit of a last call for formal questions. If anybody has anything? I do have one question um, and that is from Bonnie. And it says, can you give some example of the experiences you provide? Um, and maybe she's talking about experiential learning. Uh, yes, I think for, it's a little bit easier in some ways. Like I think for me, because in, um, I teach right now I teach IB world religions, which is very like clearly and explicitly about the, the frameworks that people use to look at the world. So it's, um, you know, by learning those frameworks, they, they then get to kind of apply the framework and, and see what the world might look like if, like if you believed these things were true. So that would be like one way, I guess, of, of, look, of doing it is um, anything that allows them to try to look at something from another perspective. So Choices has this whole series of of resources that are excellent that I use with freshmen a lot. And one thing I like about them is that they, they have debates in them, but in the debates, you're given your, your perspective. Because I think a lot of times, you know, student, people ask students, 
what they think about something and they have no idea like at this point even like with freshmen they have no idea if they're younger they might not even they don't know enough really to have really you know passionate you know feelings about it so giving them the different opinions or the different perspectives is useful um opposing viewpoints is another like book or program that has these different um perspectives already built in so if they're assigned that perspective and they have to do some work looking at it from that perspective, I think that is helpful. Um, the Global Nomads Group has, in, in addition to the Youth Talk program, they have a campfire program, which is based in VR. And they, I think, I don't know if they're still doing this, but I know they'll send like a free um, classroom set, of like headsets to classrooms if they want them, if they're going to participate. And I think, one of the reasons why I'm so interested in games and simulations is because of this opportunity that it, it holds to um, create experiential learning for different perspectives. And that could be extremely useful for people like us in rural communities. Um, and so with that program, the, the Global Nomads, if they have the, the VR, which is like the really inexpensive kind that you just put the, um, the, uh, the your cell phone into like the headset. So like it's really accessible and then you can look around. So that is more experiential than, you know, just the photograph. And we photographs are helpful, like being able to see it with your own eyes, but being able to turn your head and see it is even more impactful. Um, there's been a lot of research lately in games for empathy um, using, using VR to, for news to be able to look around and see what things are like. There are a lot of those types of activities or um, recordings that are already available. So if you have access to like a cheap VR headset and a cell phone, then students can can, can do some of these things. There's one that is um, like solitary confinement and it's designed for that purpose to try to be empathetic. So students can put on the headset, they can look around and kind of feel what it looks like to be in solitary confinement now of course that's not the same you know it's actually being there it's not as good as actually going to these different places but it's it's better than um you know just a, a photo it's a little bit more a little tiny bit more interactive There was also another question posted, maybe you want to expand just a little bit because they follow up and said, never mind, you answered it. Um, but asking about elementary students, if you want to expand. The, the original question is, how would you go about introducing global competencies to elementary students, fourth grade, as someone who doesn't have much experience? They liked what you just said. Okay. But I don't know if you want to add anything to it. So in the, the PDFs that I, I said, you know, provided in, in that folder, there is a lot for every grade level. And those frameworks, I think, can be really helpful. With the elementary kids, um, I, what I would do is tr you're trying again to get them to see it from a different person's perspective. So you're not tr trying not to do things or to get away from like look, learning about others, but try to help them see what it looks like from you know different perspectives. So having children's books, for example, not about other people, but from the perspective of people in different countries. And there are children's books in every country and you can get them in English. So if you have some of the, the stories and um, you know, books that are from these other countries, they can read them. And that's a good starting point for um, a lot of conversations about, uh, about different perspectives. There is um, the, the five college East Asia Society, as I think it's funded by the Freeman Foundation, they will supply free books like every year if you if you um if you look them up online, I'm sure you'll be able to find it. They um will set they have a book list that they create that or that they recommend for every age level. And they will send you a, a, all of the books on their book list, you know, for free, you know, if you get them at the right time of year. And those are you know great resources and I always get them and send them like to our, our middle school and our elementary school libraries so that they have those resources there. Bobby, just confirming the PDF packet that you're referencing is in the presentation, right? A link in the presentation. 
in the, the shared Google folder and that Amy put into the chat box too. I don't see any other questions. If anyone has any other questions before we turn off the um, recording, um, it says, um, oh, just in the chat, it, Bonnie says, we came in late to the webinar after school ended. Sorry, where can we find the PDF packet? So I didn't see where that was. Was that in the presentation? Oh, here it is. Joe just put it in. Thank you. I hope I copied them right. I read them off the screen and typed them in. But either way, uh, Bobby's presentation will be loaded in um, this evening with the webinar as well. So you'll have all those direct links too. Last call on any questions for Bobby? For the, for the good of anybody, I'm doing it. And thank you, Kenya, for verifying that I copied it incorrectly. And Linda put in five college center for East Asian studies. In addition to books, they offer great PD sign up for the weekly news. Thank okay. you, Linda. For, for sure. Great, great resources there. They used to do study tours too. So if you, if you, once the things are less uh, pandemic, -y, I'm sure they'll get back to doing some of that stuff. All right. All right. Well, well, at this at this point, why don't we we'll we'll do the formal thank you. We'll end the recording at this time. Thank you, Bobby, for sharing your expertise. Amy, thank you for coming along and being a great support system for Bobby. Thank you to everybody who attended. Um, and again, have a great day, everybody.